Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Well, folks, I want to just take you back again to chapter 6. In order for you to understand chapter 7, verse 1, it is, again, a wherefore, and we need to go back and see what he's talking about. In chapter 6, the end of the chapter, he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be a, my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Then he goes on and, and, and makes that statement that we just read about, he says, having therefore these promises. Those promises are that God wants to be our father. He wants us to be his children. And because of that, he wants us to perfect holiness. He wants us to separate from filth, and he wants us to be guided by his uh, direction as our, as our father. Let me just share with you, this is something that God has been dealing in my heart lately. I, I don't... I want you to take this with a grain of salt here. I want you to understand that. I, I'm not really talking about chapter and verse here. But I think it's important. I think it's very needful. And I think you understand that God's personality is a compilation of all the personalities. Seven billion people on this earth. And God created every single person in his image. And there are so many different personalities out there and different types. And people are different. People are very different. I'm not sure that God would classify them like we do. But there are people that are shy or people that are more outgoing. And you understand that every single personality has strengths and every personality has weaknesses. And with that, the weakness is really designed by God to bring us into his presence in a need that we have to be connected with him. So no one, is, no one is the same and everyone is different. And that is, by the way, I think why God can use an Apostle Paul to give out his word verbatim or verbal plenary inspiration. And you can use a John with totally different vocabulary and still have it be exactly God's word in the book of John or the book of Paul, in the book of, of Romans or 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Because Paul has a totally different vocabulary, different personality, different idioms, different way of expressing it, and yet every one of those personalities come out of the personality of God. And so none of them are diverse from who God is. And so God can use John's word to convey his, his, his message just as well as using Paul's words to convey his message. That, of course, means since we are all made in the image of God and the image of God is part of who we are, you have to understand that every single personality has potential with the Holy Spirit controlling them. And every single personality reaches its epitome or its, its fullness in Christ when that Holy Spirit is controlling those personalities. And you understand when we talk about personality, every single person is different. God designed you with that personality, fearfully and wonderfully made, knowing your potential in the Holy Spirit, he created you to a specific ministry or function in the body of Christ. Everyone's different, so everyone has different function, and it's based upon your personality, based upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit to reach that potential. Now, what that means is no one is designed to be like me, and I'm not designed to be like you. We can't go around and try to make people in our image. It doesn't work. Every single one of us have a different calling from God, and God expects us to use His personality that He has given us to do what He wants us to do. And so it is wrong to assume that someone has to do what we do. Now, obviously, there are certain things that God says to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but that's going to look different for every single person. He is the Father. We are His children, and every child is different. And God directs, it says, who, you are, who are you that judges another man's servant? Before his own master he stands or falls, yea, he shall be holding up, 
for God is able to make him stand in Romans chapter 14, verse 1. God is able to make us in our personality, in our structure, to be able to be different from other people and fulfill the purpose that he has for us. And obviously, this world is all about comparison. And we are comparing ourselves with other people all the time, and it makes us feel pretty good when we compare our strengths with someone else's weaknesses. And it makes us look like we are better than other people. We're not. Those people have strengths and we have weaknesses. And in our weakness, obviously, it drives us to God so that we'll get our strength from Him because God, I think, allows us in our personality because His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. No, no, no personality is all strength on this earth. God is all strength, but we are not because we are not completely His personality or not completely God. So, obviously, because we are His, in created in His image, we have a likeness of God, but we'll always have those weaknesses. Now, having said that, I want to, I want to bring up to you now, it, it talks about the reason why we have these promises that He's going to be our Father, we're going to be His sons and daughters, is because we have separated ourselves from unclean things, and He has received us. There is a separation unto God in the Bible. But that also implies if there is a separation to something, there is a separation from something. And so God, in His design for us as Christians, I'm not talking about unbelievers. Unbelievers do not have the ability to separate from sin. They don't have that ability. Not until the Holy Spirit comes within them and the power of the Holy Spirit comes within them that they are able to have a victory in their life over sin. But for believers, when we separate unto God, that implies that God designs us to be separated from something else. Now, for most of us as believers in Christ, we don't have a great problem being separated unto God. But we do have a problem in being separated from sin. And God has designed us in order for us to be separated from God, that we'd be separated from Belial, from Satan, from unrighteousness, so that he would be our father. Separation carries a cost. Let me give you an illustration from the Old Testament. There was a great king in the Old Testament by the name of Jehoshaphat. And I've shared this with you before, but Jehoshaphat was a wonderful king. This guy, when he became the king, he separated from all the Baal worship. He got rid of all Baal worship. He took, took that away from Judah. And in the process, he did even greater than that. He took down all the high places, which even some of the other great kings did not do. But he says in this passage, in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 4, I don't know if you can see this, it says, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. Jehoshaphat was separated into God. He was a tremendous king. And he put away Baal worship, and he really cleansed Israel. But here you have this man. And, and, and frankly, I don't understand it. I don't understand how just great King Jehoshaphat could say, I am as you are. Let's, let's look at these two kings. When you talk about Ahab, Ahab made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. You read, but there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. There's no one like him. He is one of the most wicked men ever. He's the most wicked king of Israel. And then we read this, Jehoshaphat, and the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David. Sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. He is not the same as Ahab. He's not the same king. So how in the world can he say, I am as you are? And my people are as your people. And my horses are as your horses. It, it just doesn't make sense. When he came back from this battle, the king, by the way, the king of Ahab was killed in that battle. When he comes back, Jehu, the son of Hanani, uh, Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should you do that? And again, you ask, if, if God were to ask you, should, you, should you hate ungodly people? Should you hate them? No, we shouldn't hate them. That's not what it's talking about here. What he's talking about is joining 
joining affinity, it talks about in the Old Testament, but joining in fellowship, becoming the same as, following after, doing the same things, joining together with someone who does not love the Lord. He says, therefore is wrath upon you from before the Lord. And this guy, Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, is talking to Jehoshaphat, not to the wicked king Ahab. He says, he says wrath is upon you. It's because he is not separated from the wickedness of the north. What you'll find out when you read the Old Testament, you'll find that Jehoshaphat was a great king, and he has a son, Jehoram. His son marries the daughter of Ahab. You've got to be kidding me. And so Baal worship in the next generation becomes full-blown in Judah because Jehoshaphat separated unto God, but he didn't separate from him. So therefore, based upon that, we're reading this verse in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. It says, having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves. So the first point of my message here this morning is you have to be separated from the unclean, separated from filth. Now, I, I'm, right now I just was working on one of my bathrooms, and I put a new shower in one of my bathrooms. And many of you may have probably done something like that, but if you take a drain apart, there is nothing as filthy as a drain the drain is just gross. It is so disgusting. And so I took it out and I put it in the sink so my wife could find it. I really had thought she needed to see how filthy that was too. The reason I did that, of course, is because the water was shut off and I didn't have any way of cleaning it out, so I just stuck it in the sink. And she wasn't exactly impressed with it. It didn't look like this. It didn't look white and clean. Here's a picture of, of uh, you, you understand, of the, the, the passion of Christ and Jesus Christ. And I just want to think with you for just a minute. Do we really understand what purity is? Do we understand what filth is? Do we really know what God thinks about filth? I'm not sure that we do. I mean, just, just by way of an illustration is, if you had Jesus, the passion, the passion of one who died on the cross for you, he died for sin, obviously, the sweat drops of blood falling from his brow was because he hated sin and he did not want to become sin, but he did it because he loved us. But you can imagine if he came to your house, the passionate one came to your house, and you said to Jesus, come, let's, let's have some hot cocoa and let's sit and watch some television. And, and you sat down together and Jesus sat on the couch and you had popcorn and you're, you're having hot cocoa and Jesus is sitting next to you. And you turn to him and you say, Jesus, what did you think of that commercial? It's about some resort in Florida or whatever. And Jesus tells you what he thinks and he thinks, yeah, I guess I got to give you that one. Maybe the girls weren't exactly dressed right in that, that one. Uh, well, let's, we're going to watch some other movies. Let's, let's watch some movies. And you watch these movies and you turn to him and you say, okay, Jesus, what, what did you think of that one? What did you think of that movie? Well, first of all, I'm not sure he would watch it with you. But... I have a feeling that there's a lot of things that he wouldn't exactly agree with us about. I don't know that we really think purity like he thinks purity. I just have in my notes, I think, you think? You think that's probably true? You think so? Yeah, I think so. I don't think he would actually have the exact same idea what purity is than we are. And one of the things that's interesting to me, in Hebrews chapter 5, we read these words, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. As we begin to take the meat of God's word and we're no longer having milk but we're starting to grow and, and having the meat of his word, one of the things that's supposed to happen is as we have the meat and we begin to understand the heart of God better and we begin to understand the mind of God better, our senses begin to get exercised to be able to understand the difference between good and evil. In other words, if we don't understand the difference between good and evil, what it means is we're not very mature yet. 
We haven't really been getting into God's Word and really understanding the heart and mind of God to be able to understand the difference between holiness and purity and uncleanness and filth. And some of us, I think, I mean, I think it's a good litmus test to be able to, to ter- determine whether we can see where, where we are, but do we really understand what it means to have purity, to separate from sin? 2 Corinthians 7, 2, this is the second point of my outline. It's, it's just called separated unto God's servant. In 2 Corinthians 7, 2, it says, Receive us, for we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. And as I shared with you last week that we were together, I was two weeks ago that we were together, that they didn't really appreciate Paul much. They, they said his bodily presence is weak, his speech is contemptible. And of course, they respected speech and they respected bodily presence. They just didn't see in Paul anything that had value. And as I said, you learn from people you respect and they didn't respect Paul. So Paul was really concerned about this. They're placing value on things that are not very valuable to God. And they're not placing value on things that are important. And Paul says, listen, I want you to understand, here are some valuable things. I want you to receive us. Here's value, because we haven't wronged anyone. We haven't defrauded anyone. We haven't, no, we haven't corrupted any man. You understand, purity is very important to Paul. And if you looked at Paul, you would see that this man has separated from doing these things that we said were wrong. He has grown in maturity to understand what sin is. And he's grown to such a, such a degree that he does not corrupt, he does not defraud. But they don't seem to put a value on that. I know this is off the subject, but, but just let me give you an illustration. What makes a person valuable? It just, 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 just one verse right here, but 1 Peter 3, 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Okay, you're putting a great price on something that God says is very valuable. But th- this is written to women. And I, again, I'm not picking on women at all. Again, this applies to all of us. But it says in our world today that a woman does not have value unless they really achieve something in the corporate world. Unless they get a big degree, unless they're leading men, unless they have a high salary, unless they have torn down the walls, unless they have made something in themselves and they have a name that people are saying, wow, there's a woman with, a, a, what they call it, with, with zing or something that they say on the, on, the, on the news, you know, a woman with zing. You, in order, they're not going to put a housewife on women with zing. You look at that and say, what is valuable to God? Well, obviously, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a woman having an, a position of authority. Deborah did. But, but I think in some ways we, we, we miss the point. The point is, this is what God says is valuable. Is it important to see the value that God sees in what, what is valuable in a woman? It says something, she's not corruptible. Here's a woman that has a meek and quiet spirit. Is that, is that valuable to God? Is it valuable to us? Not so much. But is it valuable to God? Does God look at this and say, here's a person who's got a meek and quiet spirit, and in my book, God says, that's a great price. That is a very, very valuable person. See, like I said, I don't think (laughs) that we have the same value placed upon people that God has. And we're really confused when it comes to what value that God places upon people. Now again, Paul says in, in verse 3, I speak this, not this to condemn you, for I've said before, you're in my heart to die and live with you. Paul says, here's value. I love you. I care about you. Obviously, they don't necessarily share that same passion, but he has a great love for them, and this is, this is something that demands their respect. Paul says he's willing to suffer tribulation for their sakes. He says, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. And Paul is starting to show the tremendous amount of cost that has been placed upon him to present the gospel. And the type of sufferings and the tribulation and the the testings that he went through for their sakes. Obviously, they don't seem to appreciate it, but we ought to. 
in the sight of God, this, this man has prayed, played a, 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 paid a price, and this price, again, costly. When God talks about discipleship, he just says to count the cost. There's a cost involved with this. There's a cost involved. And again, Corinthians, do you understand what the cost is? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Paul has paid quite, quite a cost in, in, uh, in, in serving the Lord and bringing the gospel to them. The third point in my outline, we get, get to verse 7 here. We'll skip down one verse. It says, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation with he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so let I rejoice the more. Now what we're talking about here is, is Paul sent Titus to them, separated unto sorrow. And Paul sent Titus to him, and Titus was not Paul. Titus didn't really know these people. But Paul did, and he sent this messenger to them to be able to check and see how they were doing. And Paul was not a little concerned about the church in Corinth, and Titus was also. But when Titus saw them, when he presented the word from Paul to them, he was greatly comforted them because there was something that had changed inside of them. Now let me give you some, some understanding of what this is about here. In the book of 1 Corinthians, there is a problem in the book of 1 Corinthians with a man in the church that had committed adultery with his stepmother. And that was a great sin. It involved one man and one woman. It was his stepmom. It was his dad's wife. And Paul said, this is a sin that's not so much as you named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He said, this is a terrible thing. But he said, what's even more terrible than that is the attitude of the church toward that sin. And he says, you haven't even mourned about that. It didn't even affect you that you had that type of sin in your midst. And so Paul wrote them a scathing letter saying, what's going on here? Why are you so complacent about sin in your midst? When it's so serious. He didn't, ha he didn't know how they reacted to that. He did not know how they were going to handle it. In his thinking, they could have been sorry that he was mad. They could have been sorry that they were caught. Or they could have been sorrowful to a godly sorrow that would lead them to repentance. Now, Again, if you have your Bible, I want you to look at these verses. I don't have them on the screen right here, so I want you to take and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 for just a minute. We have plenty of time here, so turn there. We read these, ver these words, though, when Paul is talking about it. He says this, For though I made you sorry, in verse 8, with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. Now again, your translation may be totally different. I'm glad for that because this, this because he uses the word repent twice, and it's two different Greek words. So it makes it really complicated for it. it says, For though I, I made you sorry with the letter, I do not regret that, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry. The word metomai is different than metanoeo. Metanoeo we use for the repentance all the time. It means, again, a change of mind. But that's not the word he's using here. Metomai is a different Greek word. I'll show it to you on the board in a minute. But that word means to regret, to feel different afterward. And, and Paul is saying, when I sent that letter to you, I really felt bad about that. I felt bad because it hurt me to have to be so mean and so, so forceful to you because you had not mourned. You had not been sorrowful about that sin. And so I was hurtful, but I'm not hurtful anymore because I understand what, what took place here. Let me, once again, I'm sharing you these words here. There are two different words for repent in these verses. The first word, again, metamalomai, an aftercare, a regret. Meta does mean change, but it also means after. So, for instance, an, an aftermind or a change of mind. Meta means change. Meta, like we talked about metamorphosis, a change of form of a butterfly. Meta does mean change, but in the Greek it also means after. So this is an aftercare. An afterthought. So in other words, after you've said something, you feel bad about having said it. That's what Paul is saying. It's a regret. 
metamelomai is a regret. regret. So Paul is really regretting what he said to them. But if you read in the next verse, now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Now again, that's that word metanoeo. That's a different word. You sorrowed to a change of mind. He says, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. Now let me just share. There is, there is very, very possible that people are sorry for sin. But it's sorry that they were caught in the sin. We go to the jail ministry and there are a lot of people that are, the, that are sorry that they were caught in their sin. But as soon as they get out, they go right back to the sin because the sin is enjoyable to them. The drugs is enjoyable. The friendships are enjoyable. They don't want to change. They don't want to start coming to church. It's something that they have an enjoyment in. There are people that are sorry that they got caught and they feel bad when they were caught. But that's not a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow is a great conviction of sin. As I shared with you, you're being separated unto God, but that implies that I'm also being separated from something else. I'm being separated from the sin in my life. And there ought to be this sorrow in your heart. There ought to be a mourning. Because not only did I hurt the person that I sinned against, but I hurt, hurt God who had to die upon a cross, who hated sin, that I put him to an open shame, that I placed that sin upon him. And especially when we do that willingly, we do it willfully, we say, it doesn't matter if he paid for another sin. It doesn't matter. We like sinning, therefore we'll just add another sin and another sin and another sin. Again, we read this, for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Again, that could be repentance to a deliverance. Not, in this case, we're probably not talking about salvation from heaven or hell, but it can. Because again, the word metanoeo means a change of mind. And you can have a sorrow in your heart that leads you to a change of mind that leads to salvation. And it, and it fits in that passage without any problem. You can have a sorrow in your heart that you feel really bad when you realize what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. And that leads you to a change of mind that leads you to salvation. The change of mind is all about the fact that I can't save myself, that I am a sinner before God, that I am lost, that I am going to hell, that Jesus died on the cross for me, that He is my Savior, and I'm changing my mind about trying to get to heaven my own way through my baptism, through my church membership, through my good works, and I'm going to be putting my trust in Christ and getting my salvation from Him alone. So that's a change of mind. There are a lot of things you change your mind about in salvation. And godly sorrow works salvation, but the sorrow of the world works death. Now, once again, let me just once again share this verse with you. For godly sorrow works repentance, metanoio, to salvation, not to be repented of, metamelomai, not to be regretted. There's nothing that you're going to regret about salvation. You're not going to regret that. And so what's happened is this. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. What, what, this is what happened. <laughs> they really took Paul's words. Paul had gotten the idea that they had no desire to respect him or obey him, but that was not true. When they got that letter, they re removed that man from them in the church. They realized this was not right, and that man had a change of heart that caused him to feel remorse and godly sorrow, and that man desired to come back into the church fellowship. And Paul, when he writes the, the book of 2 Corinthians, he said, sufficient unto such a man is the punishment which was afflicted of many. So you ought to rather forgive him. And so they brought him back into fellowship. Now, there's a huge difference. In chapter 1, they're trying to have fellowship, but you can have no fellowship with light and darkness. You can't have fellowship with someone who is not in sin and someone who is in sin. There is no fellowship. So now all of a sudden, 2 Corinthians, when this has been taken care of and the man comes back into the church, this is totally different because they're both in agreement that that was sin and both in agreement with desiring God. And all of a sudden you have a church that's once again in fellowship together. And it was so pleasing to the apostle. He felt really bad when he sent the letter, but he didn't feel bad after he saw the results of that. When Titus came back, and Titus brought them that report, and he shared with them, no, Paul, this is not, he said this, 
Nevertheless, God hath comforted those who are cast down with comforted by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, this is verse 7, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he found your earnest desire, your mourning, and listen to this, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. In other words, Paul realized it wasn't just about taking care of sin. It was also respecting the position of the apostle. And so we're looking at something that's very great. Now, please understand, in the world that we're living in, that's not what happens. Let me just take five minutes and just explain. This is not what happens. We do not want to confront people. We do not want to tell people about a problem. We don't want to say that this is sin. We want to make sure people like us, and we don't want to get people upset. But when you look at Leviticus chapter 19, and I've shared with you this, 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 with this thought with you, but it is so critical that we understand God's mind because God says, for, for those he loves, he rebukes and chastens, God says. Everyone that he loves, he rebukes and chastens. And you read these, verse, these words and he says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke your neighbor. This is Leviticus 19.17. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. He is giving us commandment to rebuke our neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Oh yeah, like that's going to work. Like my neighbor's going to appreciate something like that. In our world today, that's a good way not to have friends. But he says this in, in the very next verse. In the context of that verse, he says this, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of my people, of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's in the context of the second greatest commandment in the Bible. The first one was, Thou shalt love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's where Jesus quoted it from. And when he quotes it from that passage, he says, this is what I want you to do with that verse. Don't suffer sin upon your neighbor. They may not want you to be rebuking them, but when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, they will look at you and say, that was true love. Because if you cause them to sorrow to repentance, it brings about a totally different fellowship with them and their mate, with them and their children, with them and their family. Their, their their church, tremendous different fellowship. Godly sorrow works repentance. And so the Apostle Paul's rebuke of the Corinthians was taken in a godly manner and it changed the church. And that's what we're looking at in this passage. It is one of the ways that we demonstrate love toward people in that we hate sin. We love them, but we hate sin. We're not against them at all. We're just against sin. And when you separate unto God, you also separate from something else. And so if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, once again, I want you to understand, it is a free gift. We're, all of us are sinners, no matter what your personality is like. We're all sinners, different sin, same result. The wage of the sin is death. We're all on our way to hell without Christ. But Jesus loved us so much, God loved us so much, that he sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die on the cross for all of that sin to give us a gift of eternal life. And so you can have that gift. It's a free gift given to you. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But you have to receive it. It's not yours without reception. And you receive it by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. You receive it by faith, realizing it's not by your works. It's not by your church attendance. It's not by your, your mom and dad. It's not by your wife. You realize that you're a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior, and you ask Him to be your Savior, you put your trust in Christ. And I encourage you to do that. If you've never done that, I would love to have you do that this morning. Hopefully you're watching this on television this morning and making Once again, we want to thank you for, you for tuning into our program. And you want it's to been a delight to have Christ. you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when He died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.